Slavery in Great Britain existed and was recognized from before the Roman occupation until the 12th century, when chattel slavery disappeared, at least for a time, after the Norman conquest. Former slaves merged into the larger body of serfs in Britain and no longer were recognized separately in law nor custom. From the 17th century into the 19th century, transportation to the colonies as a criminal or an indentured servant served as punishment for both genuine and petty crimes, or for simply being poor and viewed as an undesirable. In England and Ireland, facilitated by the Transportation Act of 1718, tens of thousands of children and vulnerable adults were kidnapped from Britain and transported by sail ship to the emerging land lands of America, as a source of expendable labor for the numerous plantations of the colonies. During the same period, workhouses employed people whose poverty left them no other alternative than to work under forced labor conditions. British merchants were among the largest participants in the Atlantic slave trade. And British owners living within the home British Isles, as well as within its colonies, owned African slaves. Ship owners transported enslaved West Africans, as well as British natives, to the New World to be sold into slave labour. The ships brought commodities back to Britain then exported goods to Africa. Some brought slaves to Britain, where they were kept in bondage. After a long campaign for abolition led by William Wilberforce, Parliament prohibited the practice by passing the Slave Trade Act 1807 which was enforced by the Royal Navy's West Africa Squadron. Britain used its influence to persuade other countries around the world to abolish the slave trade and sign treaties to allow the Royal Navy to interdict their ships. Somerset's case in 1772 held that no slave could be forcibly removed from Britain. This case was generally taken at the time to have decided that the condition of slavery did not exist under English law, and emancipated the remaining 10 to 14,000 slaves or possible slaves in England and Wales, who were mostly domestic servants. However slavery elsewhere in the British Empire was not affected. Joseph Knight's case in 1778 established a similar position in Scots law. Slavery was abolished throughout the British Empire by the Slavery Abolition Act 1833, with exceptions provided for the East India Company, Ceylon, and St. Helena. These exceptions were eliminated in 1843. The prohibition on slavery and servitude is now codified under Article 4 of the European Convention on Human Rights, in force since 1953 and incorporated directly into United Kingdom law by the Human Rights Act 1998 and into Republic of Ireland law by the European Convention on Human Rights Act 2003. Article 4 of the Convention also bans forced or compulsory labour, with some exceptions such as a criminal penalty or military service. Topic Before 1066. From before Roman times, slavery was normal in Britannia, with slaves being routinely exported. Slavery continued as an accepted part of society under the Roman Empire, and after Anglo-Saxons continued the slave system, sometimes in league with Norse traders, often selling slaves to the Irish. In the early 5th century the Romano-Briton St. Patrick was captured by Irish raiders and taken as a slave to Ireland. St. Bridget, a patron saint of Ireland, was herself the daughter of Bracca, a Christian Brythonic Pict and slave in Ireland who had been baptised by St. Patrick. Early Irish law makes numerous reference to slaves and semi-free senclaeve. A female slave Kumal was often used as a unit of value, e.g. in expressing the honour price of people of certain classes. From the 9th to the 12th century Viking Dublin in particular was a major slave trading centre which led to an increase in slavery. In 870, Vikings besieged and captured the stronghold of Alt-Clut the capital of the Kingdom of Strathclyde and in 871 took most of the site's inhabitants, most likely by Olaf the White and Ivar the Boneless, to the Dublin slave markets. Meredith Ab Owain d. paid a large ransom for 2,000 Welsh slaves, which demonstrates the large-scale slave raiding upon the British Isles. Vikings traded with the Gaelic, Pictish, Brythonic and Saxon kingdoms in between raiding them for slaves. Some of the earliest accounts of the Anglo-Saxon English comes from the account of the fair-haired boys from York seen in Rome by Pope Gregory the Great. In the 7th century the English slave Balthild rose to be queen of the Frankish King Clovis II. 
Anglo Saxon opinion turned against the sale of English abroad. A law of Ine of Wessex stated that anyone selling his own countrymen, whether bond or free, across the sea, was to pay his own warigild in penalty, even when the man so sold was guilty of crime. Nevertheless, legal penalties and economic pressures that led to default in payments maintained the supply of slaves, and in the 11th century there was still a slave trade operating out of Bristol, as a passage in the Vita Wolfstani makes clear. Norman England According to the Doomsday Book census, over 10% of England's population in 1086 were slaves. In 1102, the Church Council of London convened by Anselm issued a decree, "...let no one dare hereafter to engage in the infamous business, prevalent in England, of selling men like animals." However, the council had no legislative powers, and no act of law was valid unless signed by the monarch. The influence of the new Norman aristocracy led to the decline of slavery in England. Contemporary writers noted that the Scottish and Welsh took captives as slaves during raids, a practice which was no longer common in England by the 12th century. However, by the start of the 13th century references to people being taken as slaves stopped. While there was no legislation against slavery in Ireland and Wales, William the Conqueror introduced a law preventing the sale of slaves overseas. According to historian John Gillingham, by about 1200 slavery in the British Isles was non-existent. Transportation <inaudible> 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 Transportation to the colonies as a criminal or an indentured servant served as punishment for both genuine and petty crimes in England and Ireland from the 17th century until well into the 19th century. A sentence could be for life or a specific period. The penal system required convicts to work on government projects such as road construction, building works and mining, or be assigned to free individuals as unpaid labor. Women were expected to work as domestic servants and farm laborers. Similar to slaves, indentured servants could be bought and sold, could not marry without the permission of their owner, were subject to physical punishment, and saw their obligation to labor enforced by the courts. However, they did retain certain heavily restricted rights this contrasts with slaves who had none. A convict who had served part of his time might apply for a ticket of leave, permitting some prescribed freedoms. This enabled some convicts to resume a more normal life, to marry and raise a family, and a few to develop the colonies while removing them from the society. Exile was an essential component and thought to be a major deterrent to crime. Transportation was also seen as a humane and productive alternative to execution, which would most likely have been the sentence for many if transportation had not been introduced. The transportation of British subjects overseas can be traced back to the English Vagabonds Act 1597. During the reign of Henry VIII, it has been estimated that approximately 72,000 people were put to death for a variety of crimes. An alternate practice, borrowed from the Spanish, was to commute the death sentence and allow the use of convicts as a labor force for the colonies. One of the first references to a person being transported comes in 1607 when an apprentice dyer was sent to Virginia from Bridewell for running away with his master's goods. The act was little used despite attempts by James I who, with limited success, tried to encourage its adoption by passing a series of Privy Council orders in 1615, 1619 and 1620. Transportation was seldom used as a criminal sentence until the Piracy Act 1717, an act for the further preventing robbery, burglary, and other felonies, and for the more effectual transportation of felons, and unlawful exporters of wool, and for declaring the law upon some points relating to pirates, established a seven-year penal transportation as a possible punishment for those convicted of lesser felonies, or as a possible sentence that capital punishment might be commuted to by royal pardon. Transportation of criminals to North America was undertaken from 1718 to 1776. When the American Revolution made it unfeasible to carry out transportation to the thirteen colonies, those sentenced to it were typically punished with imprisonment or hard labor instead. From 1787 to 1868, criminals convicted and sentenced under the Act were transported to the colonies in Australia. Following the Irish Uprising in 1641 and subsequent Cromwellian invasion, the English Parliament passed the Act for the Settlement of Ireland 1652 which classified the Irish population into one of several categories according to their degree of involvement in the uprising and subsequent war. 
Those who had participated in the uprising or assisted the rebels in any way were sentenced to be hanged and to have their property confiscated. Other categories were sentenced to banishment with whole or partial confiscation of their estates. While the majority of the resettlement took place within Ireland to the province of Connaught, perhaps as many as 50,000 were transported to the colonies in the West Indies and in North America. During the early colonial period, the Scots and the English, along with other Western European nations, dealt with their gypsy problem by transporting them as slaves in large numbers to North America and the Caribbean. Cromwell shipped romanical gypsies as slaves to the southern plantations and there is documentation of gypsies being owned by former black slaves in Jamaica long before the Highland clearances. Some chiefs such as Ewan Cameron of Lochiel sold some of their clans into indenture in North America. His goal was to alleviate overpopulation and lack of food resources in his glens. Numerous Highland Jacobite supporters, captured in the aftermath of Culloden and rigorous government sweeps of the Highlands, were imprisoned on ships on the River Thames. Some were sentenced to transportation to the Carolinas as indentured servants. <laughs> Slavery and bondage in Scottish collieries For a period in the history of coal mining in Scotland, miners were bonded to their Maesters, by a 1606 Act, anent colliers and salters. A Colliers and Salters Scotland Act 1775 stated that many colliers and salters are in a state of slavery and bondage, and announced emancipation. Those starting work after the 1st of July 1775 would not become slaves, while those already in a state of slavery could, after seven or ten years, depending on their age, apply for a decree of the sheriff's court granting their freedom. Few could afford this, until a further law in 1799 established their freedom and made this slavery and bondage illegal. <inaudible> <inaudible> workhouse slavery From the 17th century to the 19th century, workhouses took in people whose poverty left them no other alternative. They were employed under forced labor conditions. Workhouses took in abandoned babies, usually presumed to be illegitimate. When they grew old enough, they were used as child labor. Charles Dickens represented such issues in his fiction. A life example was Henry Morton Stanley. This was a time when many children worked. If families were poor, everyone worked. Only in 1833 and 1844 were the first general protective laws against child labor, the Factory Acts, passed in Britain. Barbary pirates From the 16th to the 19th centuries it is estimated that between 1 million and 1.25 million Europeans were captured by Barbary pirates and Barbary slave traders and sold as slaves. Barbary pirates were based on that coast of North Africa, what is now Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, and Libya. Reports of Barbary raids and kidnappings of those in France, Ireland, Italy, Portugal, Spain, and the United Kingdom and as far north as Iceland and the fate of those abducted into slavery in North Africa and the Ottoman Empire. During this time the Corsairs plundered British shipping pretty much at will, taking no fewer than 466 vessels between 1609 and 1616, and 27 more vessels from near Plymouth in 1625. Also, printed lists from London in 1682 states of 160 British ships captured by Algerians between 1677 and 1680. Considering what the number of sailors who were taken with each ship was likely to have been, these examples translate into a probable 7,000 to 9,000 able-bodied British men and women taken into slavery in those years. On 20 June 1631, in an event known as the Sack of Baltimore, the village of Baltimore in County Cork, Ireland was attacked by Algerian pirates from the North African Barbary coast. The pirates killed two villagers and captured almost the whole population of over 100 people, who were put in irons and taken to a life of slavery in North Africa. Villagers along the south coast of England petitioned the king to protect them from abduction by Barbary pirates. Item 20 of the Grand Remonstrance, a list of grievances against Charles I and presented to him in 1641, contains the following complaint about Barbary pirates of the Ottoman Empire abducting English people into slavery. 
and although all this was taken upon pretense of guarding the seas, yet a new unheard of tax of ship money was devised, and upon the same pretense, by both which there was charged upon the subject near £700,000 some years, and yet the merchants have been left so naked to the violence of the Turkish pirates, that many great ships of value and thousands of His Majesty's subjects have been taken by them, and do still remain in miserable slavery. Enslaved Africans Admiral Sir John Hawkins of Plymouth, a notable Elizabethan seafarer, is widely acknowledged to be the pioneer of the English slave trade. In 1554–1555, Hawkins formed a slave trading syndicate of wealthy merchants. He sailed with three ships for the Caribbean via Sierra Leone, hijacked a Portuguese slave ship and sold the 300 slaves from it in Santo Domingo. During a second voyage in 1564, his crew captured 400 Africans and sold them at Rio de la Hacha in present-day Colombia, making a 60% profit for his financiers. A third voyage involved both buying slaves directly in Africa and capturing a Portuguese ship with its cargo. Upon reaching the Caribbean, Hawkins sold all the slaves. On his return, he published a book entitled An Alliance to Raid for Slaves. It is estimated that Hawkins transported 1,500 enslaved Africans across the Atlantic during his four voyages of the 1560s, before stopping in 1568 after a battle with the Spanish in which he lost five of his seven ships. The English involvement in the Atlantic slave trade only resumed in the 1640s after the country acquired an American colony Virginia. .By the mid-18th century, London had the largest black population in Britain, made up of free and enslaved people, as well as many runaways. The total number may have been about 10,000. Owners of African slaves in England would advertise slave sales and for a recapture runaways. Within British society there were slave owners. It was regarded as fashionable amongst the upper classes to have a black servant and they sometimes feature in paintings, such as The Family of Sir William Young, circa 1768 by Zofina. There were black people in many towns, such as Liverpool, Bristol, Bath and Lancaster. Smaller number of black people were also found in rural areas throughout the country. A number of black people achieved prominence. Ignatius Sancho (1729–1780) opened his own grocer's shop in Westminster. He wrote poetry and music, and his friends included the novelist Lawrence Stern, David Garrick, the actor, and the Duke and Duchess of Montague. He is best known for his letters, which were published after his death. Others, such as Olada Equano and Ottoba Kugoano, were active in the abolition campaigns. The legal status of enslaved people in Europe was often unclear. In Britain it was not finally resolved until abolition in 1838, though after the famous Somerset case in 1772 enslaved people could not be sent back to the colonies against their will. <laughs> Triangular trade By the 18th century, the slave trade became a major economic mainstay for such cities as Bristol, Liverpool and Glasgow, engaged in the so-called triangular trade. The ships set out from Britain, loaded with trade goods which were exchanged on the West African shores for slaves captured by local rulers from deeper inland. The slaves were transported through the infamous Middle Passage across the Atlantic, and were sold at considerable profit for labour in plantations. The ships were loaded with export crops and commodities, the products of slave labour, such as sugar and rum, and returned to Britain to sell the items. The Isle of Man and the transatlantic slave trade The Isle of Man was involved in the transatlantic African slave trade. Goods from the slave trade were bought and sold on the Isle of Man, and Manx merchants, seamen, and ships were involved in the trade. <inaudible> <inaudible> judicial decisions No legislation was ever passed in England that legalised slavery, unlike the Portuguese Ordinacos Manuelinas (1481–1514), the Dutch East India Company Ordinances (1622), and France's Code Noir (1685), and this caused confusion when Englishmen brought home slaves they had legally purchased in the colonies. John Locke, the philosophical champion of the Glorious Revolution, argued against slavery (CHIV) and asserted that. 
Every man has property in his own person. Section 27, ch. v. By the 18th century African slaves began to be brought into London and Edinburgh as personal servants. In a number of judicial decisions between slave merchants, it was tacitly accepted that slavery of Africans was legal. In Butts v. Penny 1677 2 Lev 201, 3 Keb 785, an action was brought to recover the value of ten slaves who had been held by the plaintiff in India. The court held that an action for traver would lie in English law, because the sale of non-Christians as slaves was common in India. However, no judgment was delivered in the case, an English court case of 1569 involving Cartwright who had bought a slave from Russia ruled that English law could not recognize slavery. This ruling was overshadowed by later developments particularly in the Navigation Acts, but was upheld by the Lord Chief Justice in 1701 when he ruled that a slave became free as soon as he arrived in England. But agitation saw a series of judgments repulse the tide of slavery. In Smith v. Gould 1705-07 2 Salk 666, Holt C.J. stated that by the common law no man can have a property in another. But in 1729 the then Attorney General and Solicitor General of England signed the York Talbot slavery opinion expressing their view and, by implication, that of the government that slavery of Africans was lawful in England. At this time slaves were openly bought and sold on commodities markets at London and Liverpool. Slavery was also accepted in Britain's many colonies. Lord Henley L.C. said in Shanley v. Harvey 1763 2 Eden 126, 127 that as soon as a man sets foot on English ground he is free. After R.V. Knowles, ex parte Somerset 1772-20 State Tr1 The law remained unsettled, although the decision was a significant advance for, at the least, preventing the forcible removal of anyone from England, whether or not a slave, against his will. A man called James Somerset was the slave of a Boston customs officer. They came to England, and Somerset escaped. Captain Knowles captured him and took him on his boat, Jamaica bound. Three abolitionists, saying they were his godparents, applied for a writ of habeas corpus. One of Somerset's lawyers, Francis Hargrave, stated, In 1569, during the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, a lawsuit was brought against a man for beating another man he had bought as a slave overseas. The record states, that in the eleventh year of Elizabeth 1569, one Cartwright brought a slave from Russia and would scourge him, for which he was questioned, and it was resolved, that England was too pure an air for a slave to breathe in. He argued that the court had ruled in Cartwright's case that English common law made no provision for slavery, and without a basis for its legality, slavery would otherwise be unlawful as false imprisonment and or assault. In his judgment of the 22nd of June 1772, Lord Chief Justice William Murray, Lord Mansfield, of the Court of King's Bench, started by talking about the capture and forcible detention of Somerset. He finished with, So high an act of dominion must be recognized by the law of the country where it is used. The power of a master over his slave has been exceedingly different, in different countries. The state of slavery is of such a nature, that it is incapable of being introduced on any reasons, moral or political, but only by positive law, which preserves its force long after the reasons, occasion, and time itself from whence it was created, is erased from memory. It is so odious, that nothing can be suffered to support it, but positive law. Whatever inconveniences, therefore, may follow from the decision, I cannot say this case is allowed or approved by the law of England, and therefore the black must be discharged. Several different reports of Mansfield's decision appeared. Most disagree as to what was said. The decision was only given orally, no formal written record of it was issued by the court. Abolitionists widely circulated the view that it was declared that the condition of slavery did not exist under English law, although Mansfield later said that all that he decided was that a slave could not be forcibly removed from England against his will. After reading about Somerset's case, Joseph Knight, an enslaved African who had been purchased by his master John Wedderburn in Jamaica and brought to Scotland, left him. Married and with a child, he filed a freedom suit, on the grounds that he could not be held as a slave in Great Britain. In the case of Knight v. Wedderburn 1778, Wedderburn said that Knight owed him perpetual servitude. 
The Court of Sessions of Scotland ruled against him, saying that chattel slavery was not recognised under the law of Scotland, and slaves could seek court protection to leave a master or avoid being forcibly removed from Scotland to be returned to slavery in the colonies. <laughs> Abolition William Wilberforce, a member of the House of Commons as an independent, became intricately involved in the abolition of the slave trade in Britain. His conversion to evangelical Christianity in 1784 played a key role in interesting him in this social reform. William Wilberforce's Slave Trade Act 1807 abolished the slave trade in the British Empire. It was not until the Slavery Abolition Act 1833 that the institution finally was abolished, but on a gradual basis. Since landowners in the British West Indies were losing their unpaid labourers, they received compensation totalling £20 million. The Royal Navy established the West Africa Squadron or Preventative Squadron at substantial expense in 1808 after Parliament passed the Slave Trade Act of 1807. The squadron's task was to suppress the Atlantic slave trade by patrolling the coast of West Africa, preventing the slave trade by force of arms, including the interception of slave ships from Europe, the United States, the Barbary pirates, West Africa and the Ottoman Empire. The Church of England was implicated in slavery. Slaves were owned by the Anglican Church's Society for the Propagation of the Gospel in Foreign Parts SPGFP, which had sugar plantations in the West Indies. When slaves were emancipated by Act of the British Parliament in 1834, the British government paid compensation to slave owners. Among those they paid were the Bishop of Exeter and three business colleagues, who received compensation for 665 slaves. <laughs> Modern evaluations of economic impact Historians and economists have debated the economic effects of slavery for Great Britain and the North American colonies. Many analysts suggest that it allowed the formation of capital that financed the Industrial Revolution, although the evidence is inconclusive. Slave labor was integral to early settlement of the colonies, which needed more people for labor and other work. Also, slave labor produced the major consumer goods that were the basis of world trade during the 18th and early 19th centuries, coffee, cotton, rum, sugar, and tobacco. Slavery was far more important to the profitability of plantations and the economy in the American South, and the slave trade and associated businesses were important to both New York and New England. In 2006, the then British Prime Minister, Tony Blair, expressed his deep sorrow over the slave trade, which he described as profoundly shameful." Some campaigners had demanded reparations from the former slave-trading nations. See also Slavery in Ireland Husband selling Slavery at common law Slave trade acts Somerset's case Wife selling English custom Topic Footnotes Topic Further reading Guasco, Michael, twenty fourteen. Slaves and Englishmen Human Bondage in the Early Modern Atlantic. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, University of Pennsylvania Press. Pelteré, David A. E. nineteen ninety five. Slavery in Early Medieval England, From the Reign of Alfred until the Twelfth Century. Woodbridge, UK, The Boydell Press. ISBN 978-0-85115-829-7. Legacies of British Slave Ownership. University College London, Department of History. Retrieved 4 September 2018.